I've gone on several appointments where they're like, well, I'm telling you, you're wasting your time if you come over here, but if you, if you want to waste your time, I'll be there on Saturday, and I'll go. And when I leave, their biggest problem is trying to figure out how to break the news to their friend that they li- they're not going to list the property with them. Welcome, highly productive agents and investors from across the country. Today is July 16th, 2020, and this is Mastermind Call number 287. And uh, we have four people in the queue now. A reminder, we've got room for more. Just hit star six and hit one. And let's go to our first que- our first caller, our first queuer also. First up yeah, is actually- phone number. Go ahead, Chad. Before we before we jump in, I do want to. Uh, I did have one thing I forgot to say. So, um, as you guys know, we launched um, professional coaching as part of of our subscription. So, if you are a subscriber, you are entitled to at least a, one phone call, one coaching call per month with our professional coaches. So, in subscriber portal, if you look under the training menu, you'll now see um, an option for schedule a free coaching call. And Bruce is not here yet, but uh, you can jump on his calendar for an accountability coaching call. So anyone who just needs a little bit of extra time or if you don't feel comfortable publicly dealing with what you need to deal with on these calls, um, please go to log into the subscriber portal and under the training menu, select uh, schedule your schedule a free coaching call. And uh, you can get on Bruce's calendar for uh, professional probate real estate coaching. Perfect. And, you know, we try not to make this a commercial for our company, but there are a number of uh, companies nationwide that charge $1,000 a month for coaching, and it's something that we give you with your subscription because, we, you know, we want, want you to be successful. So I'm glad you mentioned that. Please take advantage of it. Uh, first up is patiently waiting is phone number ending in 0306. You're up first. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Hello okay? there. Yes, ma'am. All right, great. Awesome. I'm Rosie from Texas, and uh, I'm here to report my progress from last week's appointment. I got the listing. Ta-da. Wow. So excited. Good job, Rosie. <laughs> Thank you, Chad. Um, the seller did uh, throw a curveball at me. He didn't want to meet at the property that was under probate. He wanted to meet at the girlfriend's house, which was okay, and I met. And uh, we had our discussion. I asked all the questions. Uh, I took my seller interview sheet with me. And uh, uh, long story short, at the end, um, he said, so do I give you my American Express card for the services you give me? Like, I was like, no. <laughs> I said, what you can do is sign a listing agreement. <laughs> and uh, he happily signed. And matter of fact, this can potentially become three deals because the way I explained market to them, uh, his girlfriend was like, well, maybe we should sell both the houses now and uh, buy something grand style, single story somewhere outskirts of the city. So um, I'm going to continue to serve them the best I can and guide them one step at a, uh, along the way. So I wanted to ask a question about that particular situation and also sure. uh, uh, get an uh, uh, idea about my conversation with Cartsmith and Probit Plus. Okay. So um, I suggested that in this particular case, um, my client is the only heir. A mother passed away last year. He has the will. He gave me the death certificate, and he hasn't done anything. So I checked with some attorneys. A minimum of the will is a possibility for him, and it will take three months rather than 30 days because it used to be much quicker, um, which is all good and great. Um, we can sell the house. But another real estate attorney told me I can potentially just do the affidavit of heirship where three disinterested parties can show their name, and we can close, which I have done in the past. My main question is that he asked me a question about accessing bank accounts and financial institutions. Will monument, monument of will enable him to access that as well? Uh, because I wanted him to get in touch with Scott's team about you know, estate planning and all the stuff so he can avoid unnecessary taxes or ha- have some kind of guidance to go forward. Um, and he asked me that question I didn't know. So I told him I'm collecting some information and get back with him. And the word letter of testamentary showed up. So I watched the 
Mastermind 277, um, it seemed like uh, in there you guys were mentioning that there's no judgment of lien against the person who was deceased or the one who's inheriting, then maybe the minimum of title would al enable him to access the bank accounts. I'm all ears. I hope I gave all the information. I'm ready to hear your answers <laughs> on that. Okay. So he does have letters testamentary, correct? No. No, he's working he on it, not. and he didn't get, he does not. I, I'm assuming okay. the way he's talking I, about I it. I thought I heard not. you say that. So uh, it's my understanding, and obviously I'm not a probate attorney, but I don't believe monument of title is, is really, you know, that's, that's specific to the real property. It just allows you to take the okay. most valuable asset and do something with it. But, that you know, when you liquidate that asset, the proceeds are going to come back to the estate. <clears throat> um in order for him to gain access to bank accounts and make financial decisions like that, he's going to have to have the letters testamentary. Um, he has to be able to show his authority to the bank so they, you know, they can give him access. Unless, if his mother was a good planner and his name is currently on the bank account, so if it's Jane Doe and or Jane Doe or John Doe. <laughs> Um, if he was part, if he was, you know, uh, authorized on that account before, then that could, you know, he could have access now. But otherwise, he's going to have to wait until the confirmation hearing and he gets the letters. Then he'll be able to have access to banking. Okay. So from his conversation, it does seem like, uh, because he's the one who brought up and said, well, I don't know if the POA for my mom is good anymore, so I know I need some kind of letter um, to access the bank institutions, and he wanted my guidance on it. And I have no idea how to acquire the letter of testamentary. Should I be putting him in touch with the probate attorney to do that separately, and maybe we can carve out the real estate portion and handle that simultaneously? Well, when he petitioned the court, which I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. he has done that, right? So he has a probate attorney. He has petitioned, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So when he petitioned the court, they scheduled a confirmation hearing, and they probably immediately issued a continuance because of the judicial mm -hmm. backlog. So mm -hmm. that's oh, probably right. what the, attor yeah. the attorney is advising on that three months. Like, you're probably waiting for three months to get the confirmation hearing. But yeah. in this this scenario... And we talk about this pretty frequently, but the monument of title guys is specific to Texas. Texas has an express lane yeah. for several things. Probate's one of them. But you can essentially, in certain situations like this, where you have a very simple estate without uh, you know, outstanding debt, yeah. where you have a free and clear asset, it can be carved out of the probate and dealt with separately, which is really beneficial to this, this person in this situation. So he can still liquidate the asset in a correcting market while waiting for his letters testamentary. So it's a very, this okay. is a very specific situation to your state. But I, I don't know how to get him access to banking and everything else without the letters. He doesn't have any authority. And, unless, okay, so know, the goal is... Was, got it, got it. I do have a call with the probate attorney as well um, to get more insight. Uh, and by the way, I thank you so much for sending me Scott's information. I did make contact with his office, but it seems like there's a process um, to get, and there's a two-week turnaround. Um, so my understanding is, uh, Chad, Scott helps with, um, or his attorneys help with uh, the estate planning asset protection. So once we liquidate the funds, how to properly allocate them so they're not throwing all the money away in taxes, correct? Um, actually, I, I sent you to Scott because he is a real estate investor attorney, not necessarily an estate okay. planning attorney. Now, obviously, as an attorney, he can do a lot of different things, but their specialty is really representing high net worth real estate investors. So they, they use okay. crea creative strategies like owner financing mm -hmm. and self-directed IRAs with checkbook control. I mean, he's, he's one of the only pe people that I know that do some mm -hmm. of the stuff I do with retirement accounts, like the more advanced things mm -hmm. like uh, e EQRPs and self-directed IRAs. So he can mm -hmm. guide the family. He can guide the family on how to to set up tax advantaged, uh, you know, uh, investment Got accounts, it. and then become private Got money it. lenders for you or your buyers. And mm -hmm. I mean, you you can make eighteen to twenty percent a year tax free. So you can really, really change, you know, you can grow the wealth for the family very rapidly. And the I'm other so person good. I introduced uh -huh. the other person I introduced you to in Aaron. Austin can be can be the borrower. Um, you know, mm -hmm. if you can 
take sell all three of these houses, get them over to Scott, let Scott build, you know, put put it together in the right investment vehicle, and then write private money loans to you know Aaron. You just created, you know, probably a lifetime relationship, and they will mm-hmm. make about hundreds of thousands of dollars off of that versus just going and spending the money. Yes, and that is my goal. Um, I'm so glad that you mentioned it. Um, I before I had a conversation with Scott, I, I just met his discovery call person in the front yet, so they're going to make connection with Scott in a week or so. Um, uh, I did have uh, some understanding of IRA. I interviewed IRA specialist, uh, so I did call her about it, and she mentioned um, I, I was using my naive brain out of I was like, okay, let's think about it. I was like, all the money he's getting, what if he acquires the property in Roth IRA and then sell sells it, then puts the funds back in Roth IRA, that way he's not taxed. But when I talked to the IRA specialist, she said, because it's a lineage, mother to son, it cannot be bought, but I think uh, I don't think that person was fully, fully expert as Scott is. I checked his website out. So I'm looking forward to Scott's conversation and see what doors he opened up in thinking and maybe help this person out in future. Cool. Awesome. So there's not, so there's not much the, of a tax liability in, in inheriting a, a property. You don't have much tax liability because you have you the capital gain, you're, you're granted a step-up basis, meaning – it's a hot, like so you're not taxed on what the home is worth you're you're taxed on on you know but it's, it's anyways look up step up basis but if he step were to basis. inherit an asset that he wanted to hold you can inherit that asset into an LLC that is owned by an IRA or an EQRP and i know this is a lot of acronyms and confusing but like then you can get the maximum tax advantage by taking your inheritance into a self-directed retirement vehicle I understand exactly what you said. You're saying he, uh, that uh, create an LLC, and that LLC can be owned by the Roth IRA. So when he's inheriting the property, inherit the property in the name of the LLC, so that uh, he's not taxed taxed on the net gains because there is an IRA account attached to the account that will receive the money back. So I think I got enough to have some level of conversation, but I really appreciate. I'm looking forward to Scott's conversation with me on this. Cool. Awesome. So, uh, letter of testament is important. I got it. Um, the well, last question I had. Is here, why, don't, why don't you remind everybody? You've been doing this for what? Two weeks? Three weeks? Yeah, I just joined this last mastery call end of June. Um, that's when I really started. Um, but I subscribed to the leads. Uh, but I, quite frankly, I, I didn't call them. I was just letting them pile up and understand. So I did my mastery and I started making phone calls um, and I used whatever you taught and prepared by watching session two. And, uh, so in three weeks you went from never having, never having a probate mm-hmm. list, never having made a probate prospecting call to connecting yeah. with a high net worth individual with three assets and you're like, you're like, okay, that's done. Now you're looking out for his own retirement plan and how he can grow generational wealth. Yes. Good for you, Rosie. I'm so proud of you. Thank you. You know, Chad, I I really, um, I don't know um, if you have much time, but I really want to say something. I've been doing real estate for quite some time, and I always felt uh, like, you know, uh, by retail, I was just packaging the business. I never felt uh, uh, like inner self-esteem of something really good at something, you know. I wanted a niche market, and uh, one day I asked my husband, I said, so why do I want to do probate? Like, what would, uh, I really had to dig in deeper to feel convicted in serving people, and I feel like taking care of people's wealth is a huge responsibility. Like, the person who has saved every penny of their hard-earned money and built equities, if you really hear the stories of the, their moms who are baby boomers and worked so hard, and they're deceased now, their wealth must be respected with some grace and uh, integrity, and uh, even if sometimes the entire person who inherited it doesn't have the know-how, I think it's a very good deed, and I find joy in doing it, and uh, I can't wait to make great relationships happen and bring them together to help these families for long-term wealth. So I thank you guys for opening up my mind for new perspectives. I can't wait to do your case uh, study, Rosie. I think in, in five <laughs> years you will have made a massive impact in your community. Thank Rosie, you. I was gonna, ready? Huh. I was going to add my favorite part of your story is, you know, when you have the the great intentions, you do your homework, you're knowledgeable, and you're enthusiastic. You get to the listing appointment instead of 
when you cut your commission, they, they ask, you know, do you take American Express? I, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I did not bring the real estate up until the last minute. And, yeah, yeah thank you so much for acknowledging it. I, matter of fact, also just book my accountability call with Bruce for tomorrow. So I'm, I'm going to use all the resources and do my best. So thank you. I'm very excited. Well, you're thank going to be you, hard Rose. to beat. What a great way to start the call, Rosie. We very much appreciate you. Thank you. All right, Thank let's you. see. Thank let's you, see. It. That's, that's going to be a hard one to beat. Next up is phone number ending in 5464. You're up next. Yeah, um, my name's Eddie Van Buskirk. I'm here in Kansas City. Um, I kind of have a lot of things. I talked with Bruce on the phone on Thursday or Friday last week and kind of went over some overviews. I was a subscriber for a while uh, and ran out of money w before the deals came in, so I stopped, but uh, really realized the importance of what's going on. So last week I got set up, I'm signed up for this next probate mastery class, and uh, I have a whole bunch of leads that I didn't get from all the leads, but I've been manually pulling them myself, and I'm going to skip trace them uh, and start calling them. But uh, I've been role playing with my dad, who's kind of like a pain in the ass, like if you want, if, like if you're gonna call him, you know, if you can get through to him, you can be successful. I, I think. Anyway, he tripped me up yesterday a couple times, and I was wondering if you could help me. Um, well, actually, that, and then I I went on an appointment yesterday, uh, and I don't know how if if I did the right thing. Uh, my dad, he was like, "Well, I have, I have, a, an a, a realtor that we work with." or that I've worked with in the past, and then that's what I was planning on using. Like, do you just leave it there and, and you know, say, okay, they're going to do that, or, or do you still try to uh, keep asking questions and and uh, try to fi find out? I, I, don't, I, I didn't know what to do. That totally tripped me up when he said, I've got a realtor that I'm going to work with. Yep. Starts with mindset, man. Do you believe that you're better qualified to help families and estate families who are administrating estates than the average agent? Uh, yeah. Well, I'm not an agent yet, even. So I'm just working as an investor, and um, so I guess the answer okay. is do you do no. you have an agent that you think is better than the average agent? I do. Okay. Then, like, whether you're the agent or, or it's an agent on your team, what I try to do is get them there before me, and that seems kind of crazy. It's like, why would you put your competition in front of you? But I like, so the way I handle this is like, oh, listen, I, I understand. I mean, gosh, who doesn't know 19 realtors right now? So, well, listen, real estate's one of the biggest things that we see families struggle with, and not just because it's hard to sell real estate. I mean, in this market right now, it's actually quite easy to sell real estate. It's all of the other things surrounding that. So it's the most valuable asset. You have carrying costs. You have insurance to worry about. A lot of people think they're insured, and they're not. And you have to worry about how do you get the home cleaned out? How do you make sure that you sell the personal property for a fair value versus dumping valuable, valuables that you're, you, know, you didn't know were valuable? And those are the kind of things we try to focus on with families even before the sale occurs. So has, has your friend, the realtor that you guys are engaged with, have they helped you through all that stuff? And what I'm doing is I'm pulling pain to the surface, right? I'm showing them what uh -huh. they're not thinking. I'm show, I'm, I want to bring up, I want to show them what, they're, what they haven't thought about. And what I know based on experience with realtors is there's about a 99.9% .9 chance that it's been like, oh, I can do that. I have this and I have that and me, 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 right? So if I can pull some pain up and all the things that they missed, all the service that they didn't offer to provide, if I can create a contrast, then usually I can say, okay, well, listen, do you think you guys could meet with her before next Friday? Silence. And usually they can't weasel out of that because I'm giving them a, big, a, big, a large enough window. I'm like, okay, well, listen, the reason I ask, I would like for you guys to meet with her. I encourage you to meet with as many agents as you, you, you need to feel comfortable that you hired the right one. But if I could just ask to, you know, if you could just hold off on making a commitment until we meet because we're, we're going to be looking at your overall estate picture. 
And, you know, you might find after meeting with us, like the, some of the things, like a lot of families end up wanting to keep the home because we show them how to turn it into a passive income producing asset for the family. And a lot of people pay for college education with homes. But, yeah, we do help a lot of families sell homes. And, you know, on the other end of the spectrum, sometimes maximizing the equity is the most important thing. So we'll actually come in, do all of the renovation, and sell the home for absolute top dollar so the family gets more money immediately. So if, if you if meet with whomever you'd like to, but I do have a spot on next Friday. I'd love to at least have an opportunity to show you the power of, of the, the team that we've put in place. And if you don't see that value, then you can, you know, you can, it's obviously you're going to do whatever you feel is best for you and, and, and the family. But I would at least like to have the opportunity. The only risk I'm asking you to take is – let let a guy do a, a couple of hours of homework and give you his professional opinion. And whether you engage with me or not, I'll leave that with you. So you'll know exactly how I would handle your situation. Would for next Friday at 3 be a good time? Yeah. Sounds good. So I, I want to show them why this is a bigger conversation than just the real estate. There's other things that affect the value of the real estate or the strategy to be used, the amount of money the family will get. But I need to be there in person so I can understand those things. So, um, you know, in the back of my head, it's how do I get in front of this individual? And I would rather have the, my competition go in before me because I want, that, I want my appointment to create a contrast, a stark contrast. When I start talking about, you know, my local probate knowledge and, and the team that I have and this and that, and they're going to think, God, you know, Pauline didn't bring any of this stuff up. And then when I start talking about things like Rosie just talked about, like, well, you know, one of the things we do, we try to make sure no family ever goes through this again. So part of our process toward the end is to give you an hour free with our estate planning team so you at least know your options, what it looks like to have a will, an irrevocable living trust, or a revocable living trust, or some other vehicle. Um, in addition to that, we try to make sure that you know your options for investing. A lot of people think you have to buy stocks or bonds or mutual funds or whatever. Like, we have relationships with local real estate attorneys and registered investment advisors where we show families how to double their money every four years right here in their backyard where they have control. It's not being manipulated by Wall Street. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of parts to our process that don't have anything to do with the sale of the real estate. That's the easy part, and I'm sure your friend probably told you that. If not, I'm telling you, it's easy to sell homes. It's, it's not so easy to choose the right strategy that makes the most financial sense that can, that can you know, maximize equity and minimize stress for your family, and that's what we do. So Friday at 3 is a good time, and you come back yeah. at them until, the, until they roll. Just keep layering value on and showing them why your service is different. And when they meet with that other person, they're going to be like, what the hell? Like, she didn't bring any of this stuff up. She just talked about putting a sign in the yard and doing photography. And they're going to feel like so much was left out, and then all you're going to have to do is just hand them a blue pen at the end of it. And I've got a bunch of stories about this. Like, <laughs> I've gone on several appointments where they're like, well, I'm telling you, you're wasting your time if you come over here, but if you, if you want to waste your time, I'll be there on Saturday, and I'll go. <clears throat> and when I leave, their biggest problem is trying to figure out how to break the news to their friend that they li they're not going to list the property with them because they see so much value in the service we provide. So, again, bring a, bring a problem to the surface, to find a reason to get face-to-face, -face, try to be there after your competition, and be sure and take a contract because you're going to need it. Okay. Um, I have one other question in regards to this appointment I went on yesterday. The, so there's like two siblings that inherited their 95-year-old mom's house, and they now have a sister who has brain cancer in California. And they're like, we need to just sell it as quick as possible. So I, put, I went out, talked with them, tried to see if they were open to any other options. And they, it sounded like they were just wanting a cash offer. And I tried to explain, you know, there's other things that we could do. Um, she didn't seem to be that... Uh, interested in it. So I gave her a cash offer of 72000 I think. I told her uh, if she wanted to hold the note for me and do an owner finance with a like six-month balloon uh, with a $10,000 down payment and $1,000 um, like monthly payment, um, 
I could do 85000 and if she wanted us to come in, completely clean the house out, we could list the house on the market with an as-is contract um, at 100, I think 110 uh, mm-hmm. and she, I mean, she was like, well, I got to talk to my brother. I haven't heard anything back. I didn't really get a flinch. But here's the caveat is like they need to make, she wouldn't tell me how much they had to make because the estate had like Medicare bills against it, like a lien from a Medicare bill. So I was basically shooting in the dark and, you know, maybe even it was a waste of my time, but she wouldn't share that with me. And so I just had to give her the numbers, which would make it a fair value. So I wouldn't lose money. And I, I don't know how you'd deal with that in like how you should do with it or maybe a better way to. So huge credit, like for being nimble and providing options like that on the spot, huge credit to you, man. That's awesome. That's exactly how you should have handled it. You, you messed up by not getting the right, you know, the proper decision makers there. You left an opening for an objection. Well, let me talk to my brother. And now you're the one back on your heels wondering what you did wrong. And you should have a contract now. Whether it's one, you gave her three really, really feasible, really good, honest options, and you should have been able to close. You know, you should have gone to contract, but you didn't. And I, I'm being critical of you, but you're asking. So where you messed up is you didn't have the right decision makers. And when when you, you should probably take probate mastery. I show you a lot of little tricks about how to what I do in in, the, in a certain order to kind of set up and almost like a checklist of things. But one of those is asking the questions when the first time you speak, who do you feel like should be part of these conversations going forward? And that okay. way you would, have round, you would have rounded that brother up early in the process and you would have known, I'm not going to that house unless he's at least on Zoom with us or on a conference call with us. Because then she wouldn't have had that objection. What she did is you got her to the edge of her comfort zone. You gave her three really good options, and she got scared. She got afraid, and she retreated back to her comfort zone. And she she may not have she still might not have called her brother because she's still like, oh my god, I just barely missed that. I almost had to sell my childhood home, and she's got sentimental value in that, and that's probate quicksand. And that's what you hear me say. There's a massive difference between sales and leadership. And what I'm proposing is that you lead them out of that. So just don't leave leave them that exit next time. Make sure you ask, who do you feel like should be part of these conversations going forward the very first time you talk? And then that way the brother will be there. And you can, you can, you know, give them the options, have them make a choice. And, you know, their choice could always be not to do business with you, but it's unlikely when you do what you just said you did. Um, there was one other um, thing I, I, I have I marked. her brother's number. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I, I have her brother's number. Should I call him and give him the options? And now, I wouldn't do that because she may feel like you're you're back channeling her. So what I would do okay. is call her and then say, "Listen, can we three way your brother three way your call your brother right now?" I want to talk to him, but I want to, you know, obviously respect your position as the personal representative. But I just thought it would be helpful if we could all three talk, so he can at least ask the questions that I know. I, I know I threw a lot at you the other day, and I just wanted to make myself available to the family. So anyone and everyone, your brother and who else you feel like should be part of the conversation, I, I would love to at least just, you know, give you guys all a chance to have the same conversation you and I had. And then that way she's going to feel empowered, right? You're, she's going to feel respected, not cut out of the deal. Okay. All right, perfect. Well, I appreciate that. And I am, right. I am in the probate mastery for this upcoming time, so I look forward to oh, that. Good. And I have so session, session three, man. Like uh, a lot of the stuff that like I, I like 98% of my time is spent preparing and in the last three minutes of every appointment, like that last 2% is where I decide what the strategy is and, and suggest what I think they should do, but I still let them make a choice. And I think it, if you think of it as a funnel, like it's just information gathering all the way to the very bottom, and then you hand the blue pen over and you choose a contract, whether it's a listing or a purchase agreement. 
and I think you'll get a ton from that because you're doing a lot of things right. Like to 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 be able to be this new to it and lay out those three options with that one very creative option in the middle. That's awesome, man. All right, great job. We have eight more in the queue. We're going to do our best to get to all of you. Next up is phone number ending in nine seven two eight. You're up next. Hey guys, Dan Wingard here from the Seattle area. I've been doing real estate for about twenty years. And now diving into this program, I just got my first list of leads from you, and uh, the mailer should be going out, I think, in the next couple of days. So my questions are, um, and I also signed up for the mastery. I've listened to the first session, haven't gotten to the second two parts, so maybe there will be answers there. But just I, I see the contacts uh, or the attorneys there. What would be some things I could work on, you know, this week as the letters are going out? Is it contact the attorneys? If so, you know, to just ask them, would you like a you know, market evaluation? Um, how can I serve you? I see this. So any, any thoughts there or just generally diving into this, what, what are the first steps to take to bring value to these folks? I think finishing mastery, finishing the mastery recordings, um, is is I would say is your number one priority because you've made that commitment, and you're going to learn a ton from that. That'll help you more com be more comfortable when you reach out to the attorneys, which I would say is your next priority. Um, the other thing that I want you to do, like so, session two will kind of tell you, will explain building your referral network with estate planning attorneys, nursing home employees, you know, senior moving companies, you name it. Anyone who has contact with families in transition upstream of probate. Um, the other thing I want you to do is go to alltheleads.com and in the top right, type in attorney. And you're going to find all kinds of different content. You'll have mastermind calls and role play calls. But look for um, that we did some tips from the trainer videos. There's one with me and John Fraker, who is a probate attorney out of uh, Northern California. It's about an hour-long interview. It'll really show you behind the curtain how a probate attorney perceives us and what real value we can provide to them. And in those mastermind and role play call archives, you'll hear us talk about the approach. Like there's two primary ways we open the door with value. One is with a really high, highly qualified referral that's ready to, do, to talk with them. The other is to sit down and collaborate on a co-marketing piece. And because we have so many people in the queue, I'll leave it at that. You can listen to those calls. So go to alltheleads.com, search bar in the top right, attorney or attorneys, and, and consume some of that content. But those two things, well, well, that's quite a bit. I mean, that's I think that's enough homework for you. Once you finish mastery, you'll be confident when your phone starts ringing. And until that phone starts ringing, what you learn from mastery in that exercise will, will have you at a confidence level where you can approach attorneys, I think. Very good. Thanks, Chad. Sure. Next up is phone number ending in 0427. You're up next. Yeah. Hi there. I'm Janie Howard, and I am from Colorado Springs, Colorado. And I am very interested in utilizing your service, but <laughs> from what I understand from Natalie, um, it, I'm in a county where the probate is recorded after it's closed. So my question is, how would this work for me, or would it work? <laughs> it does work. Um, okay. Colorado, is, Colorado is certainly the toughest state that we've ever worked in, coached in, because mm -hmm. of the nature of how they handle their data. Um, we have subscribers who have been there, you know, up north of you, like north of, of Denver. I mean, we have subscribers all over the, uh, the eastern side of the state. But um, typically your cash conversion cycle is going to be longer in, in Colorado because the data is it's, it's delayed when it's recorded. A lot of the families will have found solutions. The ones who didn't find a solution are still in probate quicksand and they're not doing anything. But we four months seems to be the sweet spot. The people I've personally coached there, if you if you diligently reach out and prospect around month four, you'll start to get a pretty steady flow of come list me calls. Like we have a subscriber who's been in Laramie, Weld, and one other county up north, like northwest of the city. And we tried everything. We tracked every phone call, and we did nothing in the first four months. At month four. 
he, he hit momentum, and he has been with us ever since. That was five or six years ago. So it does work in Colorado. You just have to be a little more patient to get started. You're not going to get you're, – you're, you're unlikely to, to get, you know, a cash conversion cycle inside of 30 days like some of us do. Now, we just launched a product last Thursday called Probate Plus. What Probate Plus is is a, it's a data augmentation. So we'll take the public data – and we run it through real estate records and MLS records in every county in the United States. Well, the return is we not only show you, um, you know, what they, the, the estates that own real estate, we'll show you the real estate that is owned in trust, that's owned in entity, everything that's been on MLS, not been on MLS, out of market. So now in Colorado, it's, it's an easier question to answer, um, it's not, even though my answer is not too short. Like you could buy your list, you could run, run Probate Plus on it, and then we'll show you exactly which homes didn't sell, which properties. You'll find commercial property, uh, residential property. But now we can really target your efforts. So instead of, instead of hammering through 100 leads to figure out which 20 have not sold, we'll just show you the 20 that haven't sold and we'll focus your efforts. So you actually cut your marketing costs by 45% using Probate Plus because you're, you're, you're working a lot less hours and sending a lot less mail. So Colorado got a lot better last week just because we can give okay. you a much higher quality of data with a lot more information and we can target your efforts. So that should get you, it should shorten your cash conversion cycle because now we don't have to have you go guess which ones, which 20% haven't received help or haven't done anything. We can show you which ones and then you can just focus on that 20%. And this is a dumb question because I haven't learned. I don't know that much about it. But they they must have an attorney already to have opened clo and probate and closed it. So that part is done, right? It's the rest that they haven't done. Is that correct? Well, if probate is closed, they they no longer have an attorney. They have taken the distribution, so the title will be, you know, in the names of the heirs, not in the names of the deceased. And the other benefit okay. to this, like a big benefit to that, is you can do almost anything. You can you can do creative financing, lease options, wraparound, sub twos. Like you can really get creative, like you can in most other real estate, because you have a living party on title. So you have a lot more flexibility okay. in the options you can provide to the families. That's great. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I I think I'll start by taking the mastery class and go from there. Awesome. Thank you so much. Great question. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Next up is phone number ending in 6320. You're up next. Uh, hey, guys. My question is regarding hiring uh, ISAs or bringing somebody in to kind of manage the probate side, um, the probate niche, and how you would best go about doing that when bringing somebody new in who doesn't really know anything and how you can train them to either – you know, be full-fledged probate closers versus just being uh, appointment setters and, and how you will go about doing that. So do you mean more specifically a calling, like a, a phone VA or a, a total, like, assistant, like an administrative assistant? Are you talking about yeah, an ISA? Like a... I know you guys refer to them as ISAs, but I'm just going to bring somebody in to basically be an acquisition manager focused solely on, on probate. Okay, but you want them to do all office activities, not just phone work. No, I want them all all things uh, regarding probate, um, not any office activities like business office activities. Just kind of being a, a prospector on the probate side, um, not closing just yet, but working their way up into closing, and then you know bringing a caller under them. But for now, just kind of so, calling. But not not handling open. transact like. Transaction management, no, 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 and no, database no, no, management, no, no, none no. of that. Just phone none work. Of that, none of that. Just just purely prospecting, um, outbound prospecting. Um, and it's I don't know whether it's to, to bring them in to start them on closing or it's just hey I want to bring them in and start them on just opening. Um, but I don't know if it's just hey um, I have a probate person that I worked for that I want to hook you up with or you know really train them into it. I just want to know how to best go about doing that and what the best thing that you guys have done so far on, on doing that process? Well, 
In my opinion, the best thing you can do is, is hire somebody in your local market to work with you. Um, most people don't do that because of budget issues. If you have the budget, you're always better off to hire somebody local because it sounds like you you have a vision of that person growing into, you know. This person will be local, chat. Okay, perfect. So, uh, like, the, the phone work, I mean, if you find somebody who's already good on the phones, like if you can take somebody from a telemarketing firm or a sales department, um, good places to steal people right now are the hospitality industry, like somebody who's worked in group sales. Um, you know, they're probably not booking conventions right now, and their their unemployment overlay is about to expire. So if you can attract somebody from the convention business, from hospitality, or attract somebody from the auto auto industry, the people who I, just I, hammer I, the phone. I'm, pluck, I'm, I'm plucking them from a car dealership. Perfect. So you've got the mindset that you need there. You can cut them loose in our call archives. They have almost 700 hours of training that they can go through. We have fully trained VAs just by using our YouTube channel. But I would start them in the role play archive. I think we have, I don't know, at this point, 60-some 60, 60 hours of just probate role play. I would, would start them there. Um, and you said you're, you're in mastery this month? Uh, I've been in mastery before. You've been so in mastery, I'm gonna, so you have I'm you, gonna, you have the mastery recordings. I mean, yeah. I was I would say that mastery should be their basic training. That's that's yeah. twelve to sixteen hours of pretty high level, and it, it's you know so have them go through mastery first, then have them jump into the the go to uh, alltheleads.com forward slash ccva, and have them go back in time through the role play calls. And what we find is, you know, if someone commits the first week to just educating himself using all the resources we have, they should be pretty good on the phones. Um, in the beginning, my advice is don't try to get them to close in the beginning. Just get yeah. them to put people on your calendar. Like, even if they have gone through mastery and they feel confident, start them out by saying, hey, this is Chad. I'm calling on behalf of, of Jim Sullivan. He, he's in an appointment, but he asked me to give you a call just to see if I could get you on his calendar for tomorrow. Well, what is this call about? Oh, I'm, I'm glad you asked. We actually have a team of people here in, in Roanoke that help families that are, are going through probate and handling the estates. And Jim has, has built a team of professionals right here just to help families like yours. So would, would tomorrow at 3 be a good time, or, or would 5 be better? And now they defer all questions. They, they every every question that, that is asked, it's just oh well, listen, that's that's part of what Jim's going to talk to you about tomorrow. So would th three or five? And if they hit you with another question, it's the same answer. And that's pretty effective at getting people on calendars. And then you come in knowing this person is going to be a little standoffish. They're going to be you know their arms are going to be crossed when you pick up the phone because they're thinking who is this guy and why does he want to talk to me? So you really have to get in that empathetic mindset. Take a deep breath and, and just deliver value. But if you do that, it's really effective. And then over time, like a week or two in, as as that VA starts to get comfortable, then you can start to give them, you know, give them more rope and be like, all right, let's see what you can do, and maybe take them on some appointments with you, and have them make like make follow up calls with them listening. And it won't take long. I mean, a hundred phone calls and they should have the skill set to actually do it without you. Yep. Okay. Perfect. That's all I needed. Thanks, Chad. Yep. You have me there? Hello? Nine three, yeah, 3937. Hi. Next. Thanks. Okay, so um, my name is Bo, and... I first wanted to say that I'm a realtor and I just signed up like on Monday. This is my first master call. So I wanted to know, um, I know with like being a realtor with all the ethics and everything, um, it's all about disclosure. So I was wondering if it was possible for instead of doing um, the, the, what's it called, the assignment on the contract, on the PSA um, contract, if you could just charge the investor a fee for finding the property, like, separately, and then um, to do the PSA contract with the seller. Like, Multiple ways to get paid on these um, through your license. And 
So I'll, I'll first say, don't worry about wholesaling if you're licensed. You just need to have a separate entity with a separate bank account, a separate uh, ta you know taxpayer ID, and don't, do not commingle funds. And as long as you're doing that and you disclose on your investor contracts that you know Chad is a licensed agent in all these states and entering into this agreement with the sole intent to make a profit, no agency relationship exists. As long as you have okay. it, that and just in the additional terms of your contract or on an addendum, you have no liability. And I've had people tattletale on me because they said I was practicing brokerage out, without a license because I had a salesperson license, but I was wholesaling off market. And mm -hmm. the state investigator was like, no, dude, like you, my God, I've never talked to anyone as compliant as you because I had, I had my ducks in a row. So... You can absolutely do it without any liability. It's not an ethics problem at all. If you, you know, if you, as long as you're disclosing and, and you have everything that is separated, there's no risk to your license. But if you want to take the safe route and do it on your license, you can still get paid in multiple ways. So rather than taking a wholesale fee, you can take a flat fee listing. And whether your broker's okay with it or it's common in your market, you don't have to offer a cooperating broker commission um, and you know the NAR doesn't like this but you can your seller still has the right to opt out of MLS and you can still offer deals off market that's a very contentious point that's being worked through in courts right now but in the past I have you know had the seller that said they would wanted to do it quickly and discreetly so we we opted out of MLS sent it through my buyers list I represented the seller only and then in that case I take both sides of the listing, commission, the full listing commission, and I have the buyer sign an unrepresented party addendum. The other thing you can do is, simple, is just not represent the seller at all. Go find a buyer and say, listen, just like auction.com, I'm going to charge a 4% premium. So sign this exclusive right to represent buyer agreement at a 4% commission, and let's go negotiate. And then you go work against the seller. Now, that's pretty counterintuitive because we really, like most of the conversation that, that happens here in this environment is serve the seller, serve the seller, serve the seller. Mm -hmm. If you're representing your buyer, you're working against the seller. Your job is to get that as low as you can go. It doesn't okay. have to be, but... But that's what the buyer is expecting of you, right? So I typically take the position of representing the seller and leaving my investors unrepresented. And I explain that to them. I'm like, all right, so listen, Bill, you, you don't, like, you buy a lot of houses. You don't need me to represent you and charge you 3%, do you? I didn't think so. So I'm just going to charge the seller. And they're like, oh, cool. That's great, Chad. Thank you. Like, they see it as a huge value. It's, it's six one way, half a dozen the other. And if it's a low-priced asset, like one of the stories I tell in Mastery often is I had a house, a family. The house was worth 25000 bucks. I knew I could sell it to one of my landlords literally in hours, but I had to do a lot of other stuff. We had to help a, a mentally challenged family member find suitable housing. We had to get their stuff moved. It was a lot of work, and I wasn't going to do it for 600 bucks, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I said, listen, here's the deal. I would be happy to help you guys and do everything we've discussed for $5,000. I think the house will sell for $25,000. So are you guys comfortable with a net of $20,000 if I take five and you take 20 And they were just like, oh, and you'll do everything you said? That's amazing, yes. And I handed them the blue pen. So I made a $5,000 flat fee commission on a $25,000 sale. So there's a lot of ways you can get paid on your license. I still rep rec recommend representing the seller, um, mm -hmm. but you can just do a, a flat fee buyer's agency representation or a percentage fee buyer's agency fee. Okay, and thank you. And I had one other question. Um, I was listening to some of the other calls earlier, and I was just wondering, like, when is there like an initial consultation that you first have with the family, or is it like on the first? Because I heard you. Saying, like bring your contracts with you so I'm like okay on the first um, time that you meet the family then you present your offer then that's for me I try to do one one visit to the house ever and that's no longer than one hour that's just okay. my personal goal is sign paperwork within an hour and don't ask for business like provide enough value that they ask you to do business 
just like Rosie. Like the guy was. I mean, that's you know that like that's when you know you're doing things right when they try to pay you up front or when they pull the contract out and start signing it themselves. Mm-hmm. So that's my goal is I only want to see this house one time ever, and I'm never coming back because I have I'm going to put lock boxes on it today. And all, the rest of my team has to deal with it from here forward because I've done my job, and I'm going to the next new house. So, yeah, okay. I I would encourage you to ask good enough questions during the initial conversation that you have enough information to provide the options. Just like the, the last caller, I, I, you know, I commended him for thinking on his feet and not giving three mm-hmm. options, one being a creative financing option. You should have enough information before the appointment to become that transaction engineer and offer them options based on what you see when you get there. And if you if you do that, you can easily get in and out with signed paperwork in an hour. Okay. All right, perfect. Thank you so much. Mm-hmm. All right, excellent. Uh, next up in the queue is phone number ending in 6419. You're up next. Carlos, Hi guys. are you there? Hey, Carlos. Yes, uh, good. Uh, guys, I have a question. Um, I don't know if it's possible. I have a, I have in contact with one of the PRs uh, from a, um, a property. Uh, the question, uh, he asked me this question. Is possible uh, in, uh, for the sale of a house, instead of going to the to the state account, go directly to, to his bank account, bank account? Is that possible? Are you, are you saying the, the the sale proceeds instead of going to the estate, going to the heirs? Uh, yeah. That, no. that, yeah, that's the question. No? No. So the escrow has to release the funds to the estate bank account. The estate bank account, the distribution is the very last step of the probate process. The very last. Oh, okay. Okay. Okay, yeah. Yeah, you say want to make sure because I I, I, uh, I read. So about one of the it. things, Carlos, what? Why? Why does he need that money? He's out of the state uh, PR. He lives in Chicago and he doesn't have the money to to travel or to deal with the probate situation. Okay. So I just right before this call, I just did a new ask the expert interview. Um, I have been vetting estate advance companies for the better part of a year, and I finally found one that I'm okay referring you guys to. So on Tuesday, we're going to release that. Um, you'll be able to kind of watch. But um, So it's probatecash.com. I'll, I'll go ahead and tell you since you have a need right now. But probatecash.com, and I did a, I just did an interview with the CEO and, and one of the other executives that we're going to publish on Tuesday. But basically, what they do is is just what this this guy needs. So we know that there's equity in the estate. We know that he doesn't need a whole lot of money. He just needs it quickly. They can advance. They usually will do 20 to 25 percent of the net value, like the net inheritance, just to, to make sure they're not taking a big risk position. But you know, let's say if he's getting 100 grand, well, that's probably let's say he's getting 50 grand. You know, they might give him 10 thousand dollars to buy a plane ticket and pay for a hotel and you know to get the house cleaned out or whatever whatever he needs to do. Um, but that's that's what they do. So if you you uh, talk to Robin or Sean um, at probatecash.com, uh, those are the guys that I'm now recommending to help in situations like this. Okay. Okay. And uh, one last uh, question, guys. Uh, do you guys offer like uh, coaching, like one-on-one coaching? Because some I, I I have been doing calls, but I have uh, more questions than answers for for like for like the PR. You know. So uh, if there's any way that I could reach out to you guys instead of waiting for the call on 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 Tuesday. So like go to. Uh, when you're when you're in subscriber portal, look in the training menu, mm-hmm. and now under training, one of the options will be schedule a free coaching call, and you can jump on schedule uh, uh, schedule an accountability call with Bruce, 
and uh, he can okay. he can help you there. And then if you feel like you need more, have that discussion with Bruce, and and he can make a decision on on when your next call is. Okay, sounds great, guys. Thank you, thank you. All right, great call, guys. And we have one person left in the queue. That should take us up per perfectly to the top of the hour. It looks like. Last up this week is phone number ending in 0066. Good afternoon. How's everyone? Great. Good. How are you, are you? Michelle? Yes. Hi. Um, I have a question that, that uh, deals with cold calling. My broker sent out an email stating that there in New York State, there's still no cold calling. It says that we can send out mail, but we can't do any phone calls. Um, how does that work? So until the state of emergency is lifted, you cannot make outbound prospecting calls. Um, basically, you, you're relying on direct mail, um, and if you yeah. can get a response to the direct mail, then obviously you're allowed to make the outbound phone call after that because that, that direct response to the mail is the authorization to call, right? So you're relying on your on the mail. The other thing you can do is, is you know, digital, digital marketing. So you can, we've talked about this on several masterminds. I still haven't gotten around to making a training for it yet, but you can upload your probate list and create a custom audience in Facebook and you can you can advertise directly to only those people and it doesn't cost much because it's so targeted and it's such a small audience you can do it for pennies you can be in front of them you know 12 to 20 times a day for a few bucks so that's one of the the, the biggest x factors you could have um, it's it's really <sighs> It's hard to teach, especially in, in the format in, the, in on one of these calls. It's, it's difficult. But if you go to alltheleads.com in the top right search bar, put in Facebook, and it's probably going to bring up a, a, a lot of results. But in, in the last, it was in May or June, April, May, and June, we have talked about this on, on previous mastermind calls where I talk about it for 15 or 20 minutes and explain exactly how to do it. Um, Bruce and I have discussed we're, we want to sit down and design a course to show you step by step how to do it. We just have, uh, have it, it's on the list. It's on our, our creation list. So, but that's one other thing that you can do to really, you know, set yourself apart is, is do digital marketing. The other thing you can do is, is, you know, consider premium mail pieces. So we can fulfill just about any kind of mail that you can imagine. Um, we even have a thing like we call a shock box. It's basically about the size of a box of checks, and it's full of shredded paper. So it's really light and has really affordable postage, but it's very different. So you can you know change up and use more of a premium envelope or maybe a premium brochure, and like make a bigger impact in the mailbox. Um, you know, to to stand out. You can use digital marketing, social media marketing, uh, and you can also double down on the attorneys. So really building okay. out your attorney referral network. And, you know, they're allowed to call these people. The, the more attorneys in town that understand you have a team of people that can help with anything and everything, the more, the more referrals you're going to get. So the other, have, you, have you heard us talk about attorneys a lot on these calls, how to crack into those relationships? Well, this, this is, my, um, this is my, my first time being on this, this call with y'all. Okay, so I just joined. Again, I, I believe I joined in in May or June, but yeah. I knew that wasn't New York has been was really closed out, so it wasn't much I could do. So yeah. So again, if call. you go to allbelieves dot com in the top right, put in attorney and attorneys, and that'll bring up a ton of search results. And you'll listen to the mastermind calls and the role play calls where we talk about how to build your attorney referral network, and you'll get some okay. great ideas. But that's that's the other way you can really set yourself apart by getting the inbound business instead of worrying about getting caught making phone calls let the attorneys call and introduce you and then they come to you okay that sounds great thank you that help yeah, all right you. guys yeah. another great another great call I want to as I always do I always send these calls the same way I want to thank the 150 plus people that 
that showed up today. I want to thank you for your time, for being here. Particularly thank the eight or ten people that actively participated. Now, I want to challenge each of you. Take one idea. Uh, I, I think we know who the winner of the week was. Rosie's story was very inspiring today. So, But take one idea, one thought, one thing that inspired you on this call. Go out and put it into practice, and please come back next Thursday and share your results with the group. Make it a great week. Guys, stay productive, stay healthy, and we'll talk to you at the same time next Thursday. Take care. Thank you.